Welcome to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. Well, David, welcome back. Scotland! You and the lovely <laughs> Melissa were in Scotland. Tell us about it. Uh, it was a great trip. It was, uh, I've never been, uh, uh, we, get, we got to go to London on the front end and the back end of the trip, which my wife had never been to. And uh, those of you that know, I, I actually lived just outside of London uh, for my summers anyway. My mom lived over 20 years uh, just outside of London. Um, but uh, so it was kind of cool to take her and show her some cool stuff and then uh, went up to Scotland and uh, man, it, w- it was unique. And uh, I'm the always like when in Rome, try stuff. So I, I ate a lot of <laughs> haggis, I can tell you. Um, That's not and, all and, you uh, did. <laughs> yeah, well, Producer Nick, if, if you want to blow up the Internet, if you want to break YouTube, <laughs> post the picture of well, David Brooks sporting a kilt. Well, we, I was invited to the it was a, there was a conference, a CEO conference I was invited to and. It was at Sterling Castle, and if you study history, that's Robert the Bruce's castle, the first real king of, of Scotland, if you will, which took place just after the uprising of William Wallace. You know, and it was funny. Braveheart was literally on TV last night when I got home, and I was, <laughs> okay. and and basically where the the one of the battles takes place is literally in the valley of where we had dinner, and we got to have dinner in Sterling Castle, and yes, we had to be in full regalia and the basically the 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 kilt and the tux and and uh it was it was it was an enjoyable experience it was neat i don't know that i'll wear a kilt again i will tell you well but, at, uh, <laughs> at first i thought there was some kind of revelation involved and then our, our resident scotsman financial advisor paul ferguson assured me no 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 that's actually what a macho man wears in scotland no it so is there's no the, transgender revelation here I, I actually one day we were doing uh some uh some fun stuff and we got to do participate in highland games and all these Scottish strongmen, these are massive guys. I mean, and, and I got to throw the telephone pole, basically, oh, and yeah? the Gaelic and, and uh, do all these other events. And uh, we were doing some clay shooting and archery. And I mean, it was it was all, it was really, really it was a really neat experience. Now, I will tell you, I did partake a little bit in a few Scotch whiskey tastings. And I think that's allowed, perhaps <laughs> even encouraged. And man, do they have so many different distilleries, et cetera. And one of the coolest things for me is I actually got to go to the home of golf. Uh, Oh, Always wanted to, to go. St. Andrews? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So I, I went to St. Andrews, and um, you know, it's kind of great. I didn't know some. I love history, as you know. There's a beach right along the first hole. Okay. That's where Chariots of Fire was filmed. That's where the running scenes from Chariots of Fire oh, were filmed on goodness. that beach. I learned that. But uh, I, I got to have lunch in the uh, the Duvigan Pub, which is a pub of literally about a block from the 18th green, and all the pro golfers go there. Their pictures are all over this pub. It was just a great experience. It was it was a lot of fun. Yet it was some business there, so um, you know, was able to to get some great knowledge as well and just have a good time. So Fantastic. Well, I've got to bring you back down to earth here. We have a lot of news to cover. Actually, even before we do that, uh, David, uh, a very popular event now that we've had a few years running at Retire Smart is mm-hmm. annual Shred Day, and that is coming up in just a few weeks. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, you, you probably just finished up your taxes or, or you follow your extension if you're me, uh, but you, you're, you're pretty much done the tax season. So we remind people every year, the only things that the IRS will ask you for is up to seven years worth of documentation. You really don't need to keep anything. And we have clients that bring us statements from 1982, you know, and I'm like, you don't really need much of that information as long as you have cost basis for any of the things that you own. But uh, so you, you want to shred documents that have sensitive information, things that have your social security number, your health care cards. People have old stuff in their house, and they don't realize identity theft is a real problem. So we offer up shredding. You can bring all your documents to shred. And this is for our listeners, too, by the way. But you just need to register. You're going to come, and you're welcome to bring two full bankers' boxes full of stuff, complimentary, to get shredded on site. And our shred day for our clients and for our listeners is Saturday. May 20th, that will be from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. But again, we need you to just give us a holler that you'd like to be able to come by because we have to anticipate how many people uh, will be coming. And this is, a, as you mentioned, a very popular event every year. 402-369-7777. Just let us know you're coming to Shred Day. Saturday, May 20th, a Saturday morning from 9 to 11. Uh, all right, on to the news, into the news. David, you mentioned that you are concerned M2, the money supply, is falling, and you rolled out some numbers for the staff this week. Would you uh, share those numbers with the listening audience Uh, and tell us what they mean? Okay, so M2 is how economists and folks like myself track how much cash is basically in society, in the system, if you will, right? And so this is what economists look at. Basically, this is your CD, your money market. This is cash you can get to, not your investments, but cash, right? Uh, savings accounts and what have you. And M2 money supply increased like never before through the COVID stimulus bills, which is why we had this runaway inflation in the last several years. 
and it is crashing like never before seen. And this is a telltale sign of what's coming, which we talked about back at our state of the markets. Deflation is going to be a very big problem here in about a year. So M2 Money Supply, it had its biggest drop in history, folks. So we just went down 1.2% month over month. That's the biggest drop. That may sound like a small number since 1944. I mean, think about the present set there. A 4% year-over-year drop, that's the biggest drop since 1934, Chip. And a 6.1% annual rate, uh, is the uh, minus on the annual rate, is the biggest since its peak in July. That's an eight-month annualized change there. This is meaning that cash is being sucked out of society, okay? And that means there's going to be less money for you to go borrow. And this is part of the reason we're having this bit of a banking issue we're seeing, right? We had banks... Go down. We talked about uh, Silicon Valley Bank a couple weeks ago, and now you got First Republic First this week Republic. is the one. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that are, you know, they're probably not going to survive. I mean, I just can tell mm-hmm. you that that's probably now they're trying to negotiate a sale and move assets around. They just reported their earnings earlier this week, and they their deposits, they were rated over 54% of the deposits left the bank, right? And, and so they had to get other banks to lend them money so that it was net only down about 40%, whatever the exact number was. But you can't survive as a bank if people take half their money out at a whim. And so this is going to continue. We talked about this. There'll be more fallout. More banks will be in trouble here on the horizon. What does it mean for you? Is It means you need to understand where do you have your assets at? Where is your emergency fund? What institution is it? Are you under the FDIC insured limits? No one's ever lost money under that, so don't, don't panic. Um, and there's nothing wrong with small community banks. You just need to understand you can ask them for their financials. And any bank will share with you how strong they are, what capital reserves they have. And there's plenty of great banks right here in Nebraska that are phenomenal banks and aren't going anywhere. The, the sad part of this, though, is the net benefactor is this is what we call the big four, the $3 trillion banks. And that's Citigroup, uh, Chase Manhattan, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America. You know, and, and so these big banks are the ones that are benefiting unfairly from this. And that's why they're going to keep pushing it. And kind of because quietly they're gathering assets uh, in an alarmingly fast rate. Well, the mega banks seem to be the ones playing fast and loose with the rules, too. And not. Well, I, yeah. I was very glad to hear what you just said about the community banks, the smaller banks. They're solid. They're stable. See, when you roll out numbers like this, and when I hear shrinking money supply and I see dates like 1944, 1934, I keep gravitating back to the run on the Bailey Savings and Loan, and it's a wonderful life. And uh, But that doesn't need to happen. It shouldn't happen. Uh, just don't panic is, is the advice no, for most but it, of us. But if you're in a position where you have a lot of cash, and, and we have a lot of clients that have $600, $800 million sitting in bank accounts, right? They just, this is kind of just safe money. It's not their investment money with us. They've done well. In life. But, they, it, but some people are nervous. We get phone calls. So, folks, you have to understand how FDIC insurance works. It's account titling and it's tied to your Social Security number. So if you're a married couple, you can have an individual account each and have $250,000 fully insured. And then they can have a joint account with another. Two fifty. You could have seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in that local community bank, and you shouldn't feel any any urgency there. But if you if you're nervous and you want less than that, we offer treasury management for our clients, so we can put them in the U.S. Treasuries, things like T bills. And I can tell you right now, you can go out on like a seventeen week T bill this week, and the rates were over five percent, Chip. And you don't have to pay state income tax on that, by the way. So um, better than a CD typically in that situation. But anyway, that you, you just you need to have someone explain how all the parts of a true holistic financial plan work. And that's how we've come up with a proprietary smart planning process. But so, but anyway, you know, the money supply is shrinking. Make sure you're just not sitting on your hands and not having a plan of action. Well, speaking of crunching numbers, uh, David, you sent me a story from the Wall Street Journal. And I know that you are a data-driven guy. And wow, the data in this story, the headline is New York versus Florida by the numbers. And the Wall Street Journal broke it down by the numbers. And Oh my gosh! It it's Florida right down the line. Well, yeah, they're it, it, ironically they have pr- pretty similar populations. Although, although I was surprised, Florida now has surged past New York about well, two well, and a half million more people. That and that's just it. We flip flop. So New York yeah. was about four million ahead. You go back about just five years ago, and so just uh, according to the article here, Florida's almost at twenty two and a half million people, and New York just went under twenty million people for the first time in a long time, and we're seeing exoduses from states over-regulating, over-taxing, and you just can't afford the cost of living in these states. And, of course, New York has almost an 11% state income tax rate, right? And then the city of New York 
has another tax on top of that, you know, and you're so, up to nearly fifteen percent. Yeah, you're living in New York City. Right? So if you live in New York mm-hmm. City, you're paying I think fourteen point eight percent on top of your federal, which is currently thirty seven, soon to be thirty nine point six under current law, right? And then sales tax in New York is a little better; it's four percent. But again, cities add taxes on just like every other place these additional taxes. Versus Florida has a six percent statewide sales tax. So, but remember, no income tax, no yeah. state income tax. Correct, in zero. That's the trade off. And yeah. and pro- and property taxes are more reasonable in Florida. Uh, you know, way more reasonable than they are here, percentage wise. Uh, you know, on, on the assets. But anyway, yeah, it, it, it this is a, a it was a really good article because it just like you said by the numbers, Florida wins by a, a landslide, right? And so now their current governor, Ron DeSantis, is telling politicians, look, anything you want to spend money on, you got to prove me you're going to get the growth to get it through, right? And so they kind of talked about do pro-growth strategies and the economy grows, and then we can afford to do more services for our clients or for our constituents. My favorite sentence from the story was, if Florida politicians want to spend more, the state's economy has to grow more. They rely on the sales tax. Imagine that. Somebody might have yep. went to an economics course or something, you know. Yeah, pretty... Instead of just raising tax rates. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. So, mm-hmm. so again, don't panic if you're worried about where we are. In fact, uh, before we went on the air this morning, I was telling Chip that I saw a, a, a chart. The average citizen in the United States' is tax liability is fit, just over $5,400. And they ranked all 50 states, and Nebraska was ranked, I believe, 36 in, in the chart I saw this morning. And I don't have it referenced. I'm sorry. I don't have it with you. But we were just above that number. We weren't far behind it. But New York was the 50th state. Actually, D.C. was the worst, though. If you add D.C., it was 51. Okay. They ranked the worst. Uh, but New Yorkers pay more than twice what Nebraskans pay average for tax. And this is all facets of tax. Okay, We're talking income tax, sales tax, property tax, and usury fees. You, like you have to pay registrations for your vehicles and all those things. All that was calculated into this. And so we are twice as good as New York is. But we're seeing migration, and we're seeing it from California to Texas. We're seeing it from from New York and New Jersey, et cetera, down to Florida. So states that are, uh, are have an appetite for growth and a low tax environment are winning clearly. That's the message here. We manage all this so closely. We track it so closely, I should say, because taxes, uh, that is a major part of your retirement, a major surprise for some people, their tax burden in retirement. That's part of the report card, 402-369-7777, complimentary report card. No charge, no obligation. We'll look at your uh, your entire financial situation, including your tax situation. Maybe you're in good shape. Maybe you need to make some changes, especially in the current environment. Find out. 402-369-7777. Complimentary report card. 402-369-7777. Up next, it is vital that your estate plan is properly integrated with your overall retirement plan, especially where taxes are concerned. That's why we partner with the state planning attorney, Colin Kastrick. He joins us next on Retire Smart with David Brooks. Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. The A in a smart plan stands for advanced planning for all aspects of your retirement. That includes making sure your loved ones are taken care of after you're gone. Estate planning is a key part of your overall retirement plan. That's why we partner with an estate planning attorney, and he's with us today. David, please introduce our special guest. Thank you, Chip. Yes, once again, we have our, uh, our, our friendly estate planning attorney extraordinaire here, Colin Kastrick, in from the law firm of Patino King. To, to One, hey, thank you for stopping by, and uh, you know we appreciate you dropping knowledge on our audience every so often. So how you been? Good, good. Yeah, thanks for having me, David. Good to be back. Good to be back. Well, it's uh, spring is really here, right? Weather is really turned finally here, but... Uh, you know, one of the things when people are doing the spring cleaning at home is sometimes when we're doing reviews with clients, one of the things we ask them is, hey, you know, when was the last time you reviewed all your documents, your wills, trust, whatever you have in place? And of course, it's very common that you know people have, that that thing needs some spring cleaning. There's dust on the on the folder or the uh, you know the binder, if you will. And they're like, yeah, we set all this up, but it was when we still had kids in the house. I'm like, well, how old are your kids again? 34, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yep, yep. Every time. It's like, well, then they're a little kid. At least they had something, I tell people. Yep. You know, but, so, you know, yeah, it needs, so, to be, it needs to be reviewed. So we we constantly remind clients that a, a part of our service is you will do a complimentary review for our, our listeners and for our clients just to let them know, hey, if what you've got in place is okay, but even if you wanted to put something in place if you don't have anything, and sadly, that's over half of America, uh, has nothing in place when it comes to estate documents, but 
what I wanted to talk to you this week specifically about is because it's come up here often and there's a lot of misinformation out there is gifting, right? When people want to gift, uh, well, on the most basic level, right? They want to gift money to their children, right? They're doing okay. They know they're not going to spend all their money. So they want to start gifting to their kids or their kids and their spouses and even grandkids. And they get confused on if they have to pay a tax or not. So can you talk a little bit about the gifting rules as we sit in 2023? Yeah, it's, it's a big question that I get all the time. And it, people do get confused and they hear about this gift tax and things like that. And so they'll, they'll always ask me, you know, what, what happens if I gift to my kids? And they always hear about this limit, you know, 15, 16, 17,000. What is it? So what the, what the law says basically is that you can give $17,000 per person per year and nothing has to be done. Right, no filing, no nothing. Nobody owes tax. You don't owe tax for giving it. They don't owe tax for receiving it, unless you're doing tax taxable assets like IRA. Don't do that. Don't give to IRA assets and things like that. But as long as you're giving cash or whatever it might be, yeah, nobody's going to owe tax. If you give more than, you can still give more than that, and that's a big misconception. If I gave my kid more than seventeen thousand dollars, nobody owes tax. What happens, though, is you have to file this return with the IRS, and we call it a 709 form. And all that's saying is, hey, IRS, I gave more money than I was supposed to or was allowed to do. They just want to know about it. And that comes off of your lifetime gifting coupon. And right now, that coupon is extremely high. It's yeah. just under $13 million. So as long as you're not giving more than $13 million, you're, you're safe. You know, you want to file that form, but there's no, nothing's going to happen there. Well, what you bring up, though, is incredibly important here, right? So the, the estate exemption is the same thing as the gift coupon Colin is referring to. Right, so right now. Yep. So it's just a tad under $13 million a person. So for a married couple, if you structure it properly, and some people don't, so they give up half of this, you can double that number. But you've got to plan ahead. It's just not automatic. So basically, you could gift away almost $26 million. Now, for most of our listeners, that's an insane number. But I can tell you, we have a lot of clients and we have a lot of our listeners that have family farms, generational wealth that has been in the family five, six generations over 100 years. And these farms have gone up so much in value that they may want to start consider if it's going to stay in the family forever using that very strategy to gift it away. Because, folks, in less than two years and seven months, you don't get that big exemption anymore, do you? Yeah, it, it cuts in half. And so we always say you can use it or lose it. So you can, I always equate that to a coupon. So right now I've got a $13 million coupon. David's got a $13 million coupon. And so we can use it how it's valued right now, or we can wait to see what it's worth when we die. And, I, and I'm telling you, most people in my field, we think it's going to, obviously it's going to go down here in a couple of years, but we don't think it's going to get to the height it is right now you know, in, in our lifetime, most likely. Well, and, and let's face it, in negotiations, when we have our legislators in both locally here in the state level and in D.C., when they negotiate this stuff, it is one area that typically the right side of the aisle, the Republicans cave on this issue a little bit to get something else done because it doesn't affect everyone, right? So it's mm -hmm. not going to be the everyday uh, Main Street American that's really worried about their estate and all this. So it's an easy area for Republicans to not necessarily hold the line, so to speak. So I, that's why I think we'll always have what we refer to as the death tax or the estate tax. But there are some proposals that take that number all the way down to a million dollars, which would be disastrous. Think of all the family farms, the family businesses that couldn't transact or trade. You know, you couldn't keep it in the family. Now, this is, again, why it's so important you talk with someone like Colin to plan this, because if you don't and you go over that limit, so let's just say you had a $20 million worth of farmland out in the family and you didn't take any action, and one spouse passed and you still didn't take any action. And then we have one surviving spouse with a $20 million estate and the exemption will be around $5.8 or $6 million in a couple of years, whatever that number is. $14 million of that is going to have a tax starting at $0.45 cents on the dollar federally. There's more for the state of Nebraska, by the way. And you've got nine months to come up with it. So what are you going to do? Yep, you end up selling that asset. It's, yeah, it's unfortunate. At fire sale prices because we know... And you can get, I think, one extension on that typically, right? Yeah, so you six can, months you automatic. Push it. So 15 is the, the, the threshold. But, but yeah, you got 15 months. That's not a lot of time to sell a $20 million asset no. or even a family business, a local restaurant. I mean, there's just so many things that people need. I say it all the time, Colin. You don't know what you don't know. In fact, you remind me, actually, you and I worked with a client a couple of years back. And this is very common, folks. If you happen to be cohabitating, in other words, 
you're a couple, and for all defined purposes, you I've even had one client that introduces his spouse as his spouse, yeah. but they are not legally married, and everybody has their own reasons. We understand that, and it's very common when we have widow and widowers, uh, you know, find a companion later in life, or and just for one reason, they do not decide to ever marry. Well, the, one particular client has some assets, and once his investable assets, which was well over seven figures, to go to his children that live in another state. But he has a home here, a beautiful home on a country club, et cetera, that he plans on leaving to his cohabitant. Well, the cohabitant has guaranteed income, pension income from previous jobs, but doesn't really have any assets, right? No liquid assets. Yeah. When, when this person inherits the house, when he passes and she inherits the house, she's going to pay now in the state of Nebraska. What used to be 18%, thank goodness now it's just, but it's still an exorbitant amount, 15% tax inheriting that asset right yeah yeah it, it's ridiculous but you know so if that house is worth seven hundred thousand dollars and that's about what it is <laughs> that's a pretty that's over a hundred thousand dollar tax bill which means she's going to most likely have to sell the house unfortunately yeah so it doesn't do anybody any good and that, that's the unfortunate thing nebraska's got a lot of benefits obviously living here but inheritance tax you know it's just we're one of the state and there could be worse you know the state you're from maryland has both inheritance tax yeah and death tax but still we have the highest top rate in the United States for that tax, 15%. And, but it can be avoided just mm -hmm. by understanding the gifting rules today. If she plans on staying there until her passing, he could gift her the house today, no tax liability. We just have to file the form, as you said, 7 or 9, and it's done. So, again, there's not a lot of problems we cannot solve if we know the outcome you desire and you're willing to, to do the steps necessary. But some people, ah, it's just a hassle. Yeah. Well, I promise you, your kids will thank you or whoever the beneficiaries in your state will. So yeah, you're saving a lot of money for them. And, and you know, you can't put your hand, you can't put your head in the sand. You just can't, yeah. you got to at least have that conversation. And sometimes it's an uncomfortable conversation to have, but it's a lot better than paying a bunch of tax. All right. So we're, we're talking about when we're passing assets on. So I want to talk about something else that's come up recently here is probate, right? Mm -hmm. So we we'll always tell people where there's a will, there's a Probate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. But probate is when you, the court basically takes your assets through the system to make sure they're dotting the I's, cross the T's, and giving it to who it is. It's it's a necessary process, if you will. Uh, you can avoid it though if you you work with someone like Colin and use trusts, etc. But I want to talk about probate specifically. If you have assets in other states, in other words, maybe you own some farmland across the river in Iowa, family farmland, but your home is here, and you've never thought about what probate means for your kids on that farm. Can you talk a little bit about what that would look like? Yeah, let's uh, get two questions out of that. We have a lot of clients with with uh, you know ground in Iowa or a different state or things like that, and you know the laws of the state and where you own that property they govern. So in Iowa, if you have farm ground over there and you just have a will here, you will have to probate. Your kids will not only have to probate here in Nebraska, but then they're going to have to open up what's called an ancillary. So it means an additional probate in the state of Iowa. So they're double dipping on fees. Iowa's probate is a little more. Um, expensive than Nebraska's probate. So we want to try to stay out of that. You know, in every state in which you own property, you're going to have to probate unless we have it taken care of. So some clients have a vacation home in Florida, you know, farm ground in Iowa and house here. That's three different probates. That's three fees, three attorneys. It just causes quite the mess for the family. So you just, and there's ways to avoid it completely if you just have that conversation ahead of time. Yeah. So, so when it comes to avoiding probate, depending on which state it is, and you don't necessarily have to throw all your things in a trust. That That is one mm -hmm. and probably the preferred way uh, because trusts stay private, folks, as long as they're written correctly and executed properly. But you can also, like here in the state of Nebraska, and about half the states in the United States allow for what I call TOD, T-O-D-D, transfer on death deed. Can you talk about that? Yeah, basically, if you, if people are familiar, and Dave, you're familiar with obviously putting beneficiaries on your account, right? You can put, I have a life insurance policy. My spouse is my beneficiary. Well, thank God in the state of Nebraska, you can actually put a beneficiary on your house, right? Now, you need to have legal counsel help you with this because we don't want what's called title defects. That means there's a problem with the deed. So you get an attorney to draw you up this transfer on death deed, and you put your kids as a beneficiary. And then what happens, just like on your life insurance or on your retirement, we file the death certificate, the house goes to the kids. Now, there's a few other steps other than that, but it makes it a lot cleaner, simpler, and it keeps it out of the probate court, which is, which is most people's goal. Absolutely. So the idea is you do not have to have this $20 million state we started talking about. You could just have a $500,000, $800,000 state, your IRAs, your, your retirement accounts, your bank accounts, your cars, your personal belongings, jewelry, and maybe your home uh, easily titling over that number. But you need to have an estate plan in place to make sure your desires are met and with the efficiency and the transfer happens seamlessly to your beneficiaries, your spouse, kids, or charities, whoever you want to bless, right? 
Now, this is stuff that Colin and one of our advisors here, Mike Schutel, cover a lot of this content in our upcoming class. In fact, you guys are teaching here, coming up here uh, May 10th, Wednesday, May 10th, and or Thursday, May 11th. We have our next estate planning workshop that you will be leading here, Colin. Uh, and I think that is at uh, 6.30, is that right? Yep, yep, 6.30, and it's like it's, it's uh, free to join, and uh, you know, it gives some good information about what you, uh, what you might not know about this stuff. Well, you, always, you and, and, and Mike Shute will always get rave reviews from this. So, folks, if you would like to attend that, we're out of time for this segment this week. Just give us a call now at 402-369-7777. Again, 402 369 to get registered for the estate planning workshop with Colin Kastrick. That'll be, again, Wednesday, May 10th or Thursday, May 11th at 6.30 p.m. right here at the Midwest Learning Center. Colin, hey, thank you so much for stopping in the studio this week. Uh, I will look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, Chip, what's next? Up next, you have questions, David Brooks has answers. Q&A is next on Retire Smart with David Brooks. Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. Into the Q&A we go. David, the first question is about 401ks. I'm in my early 50s and have been in an employer match 401k plan for a decade. I thought there was just one basic 401k plan. It turns out there are many options. How do I determine which one is best for me? And then, David, the, the questioner asks, if I determine that the best one is not the one I'm in, can I make a change or am I stuck with whatever my employer offers? Okay, so in, in general, a 401k, that's just the titling of the type of account, okay, which was discovered by mistake, actually, by a CPA in the tax code. It was never actually intentionally crafted or, or written on purpose, but it allows for a deferral, you know, to taxes to if you were to incentivize employees through what's called a defined contribution plan, put money into a retirement plan. So we want to incentivize you, Chip, to save for your retirement. So companies would allow you to put money in this plan, and then you would get to defer that off your taxes. So it comes off pre-tax. And then most companies now offer a match to incentivize such behavior. Now, why would the company do that? Now, first and foremost, it's not because they're just super friendly, right? I, I want to explain to you. There are tax incentives for the company, for me as the boss, to offer such a plan and it also allows me to defer even more money, just so you know, if I choose to, in the structure of the plan. And there are many different structures of these retirement plans. That's and for, all right. The employer should have a benefit, too. Well, absolutely. So, so, but the understanding is, uh, the question is, is there different types? You betcha. And, and so let's just talk general workplace. So, yeah, 401Ks, there's 401As, 409s, there's 457s, there's 403Bs. Depends on the type of organization you work for, profit, nonprofit. Uh, a, a public entity like a you know school board uh, or or uh, fire you know, police. My et wife's a yep. teacher. Yep. She is so, a 403. So there's multiple different types of plans, but in general, they're all trying to perform the same thing. They're trying to incentivize you, the participant, to ins save for your own future. Now, the problem here is most of you are deferring money into an account. And if I surveyed the audience, I can't see anybody, but I actually had a workshop where I talked last night. And 100% of the room put their hand up when I asked, how many you think tax rates will be higher in your lifetime? And 100% <laughs> of the hands went up in the room. So if you're thinking that's the case, why are you deferring money into a retirement account today when you could pay a lower tax today than you're going to be paying January 1st, 2026? And this is fact. This is just what the rules are. Now, you don't want to leave free money off the table. So if your company offers that 3 or 4 or 5 or 6% match for you putting it in, Certainly take advantage. That's 100% return on your money. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal, right? But there are other ways and better strategies you can utilize, to, in our opinion, to set up yourself for a better and more tax-efficient retirement. So the, the question is, are you stuck with what your employer offers? Yes, for what they offer. But you are not stuck with that as your only option to save for retirement. So in other words, take the free money they give you and then work with a good professional like you know like us or someone else but find a good fiduciary based planner and, and find out what other options are available for you and, and you may be surprised to know that you can put yourself in a much better position especially if retirement's 10 or 20 years out the window so yeah there's nothing to stop you from investing in additional 401k accounts take the employer match on whatever terms the employer is offering but you can still invest in other 401ks if you want to. Well, no, no, no. You can't do other 401ks. Oh, good. Well, then let's correct. <laughs> so you can only participate in one active 401k plan, but you can participate in an IRA outside the 401k, or even better, in my opinion, a Roth IRA, 
And just so you know, even if your income is over limits, there are ways to still use the Roth IRA, even if your income says you can't. And, and for that, we would actually need you to come in through our or report card process to explain how that works. But again, there are a multitude of areas that you can save for retirement on a tax advantage basis, but you got to have a plan and know when you're going to access these dollars or which strategy would be correct. Well, actually, David, our next question is about IRA rollovers. Um, the question is, what are the advantages and disadvantages of rolling over funds from a 401k to an IRA. Okay, there's a myriad of pros and cons here. So number one, the 401k uh, is going to have limited investment options typically. Most 401ks only have 20 or so options. In other words, and usually these are what's called target date funds today. The pro side of that is they're they're usually pretty cost efficient today. It used to be 401ks had tons of fees, but the Department of Labor has really hammered them to, to lower the fee exposure for the participants. So the cost of most 401ks is pretty reasonable, if not even more advantageous than other options. So that's the pro if you leave it there. The downside is you have very limited room to hide. Like maybe you're nervous about the economy and you're just a couple years away from retirement. Maybe you're in your early 60s and you're going to work for another three or four years and you've you know, piled up this nest egg, $500,000 million, whatever it is, and you, you're a little scared the markets may go south. Well, if there's no options to hide, that's where you may want to consider a rollover to an IRA. And you can even do this, Chip, while you're working with most plans once you've uh, attained what's called in-service withdrawal age. And for most plans, that's going to be 59 and a half. Even if you're still working, you can still contribute to the plan, et cetera. So the advantages of rolling over to an IRA is the world becomes your oyster. You can invest in anything once it's inside the IRA umbrella. Then you can also start to implement tax-saving strategies, potentially, like one of the things we do is Roth conversions. We'll show you how to fill up the current tax bucket you're in and move the dollars from your IRA to your Roth IRA at the lower tax rates you're paying today than where you're going to be in just three years. And again, a multitude of options. You could even then use that IRA if you wanted to buy things like gold or silver or real estate. Again, we're not making any recommendations here, but the, uh, again, the world becomes your oyster there. So there's a lot of advantages and a lot of disadvantages. And with your new IRA, if you're going to hire a financial professional, you're probably going to incur some kind of expense or fees, right? We, we charge a fee to manage dollars here. So there's costs and you'd want to make sure you compare them, but there may also be savings available to you. And you, I mean, there may be new options. So there's a ton of stuff to unpack in that question. The, the bottom line is that would be a perfect person to sit down and have a consultation with a licensed financial advisor who can lay out all the opportunities and things that are available to them so the client can make or the potential listener here could make an informed decision on what's best for them. David, uh, this next question could be a whole segment, and I'm only going to give you about 30 seconds, but it's a question on, on taxes on the sale of an asset. I know you run into this a lot. We have a farm in our family that nobody wants to maintain. It's probably worth at least $2 million, but we have been hesitant to sell because of the tax bite. We keep hoping the tax picture will brighten, but that looks less likely. Should we just go ahead and sell it and take the hit? Okay. That, that is a very, very common question we get from clients. They have appreciated assets, and family farms are very common around here. We're usually into the third generation by this time, and their kids don't want it. They're cash renting it to a neighbor farm or CRPing, et cetera. But the values have gone up so fast here in the last five years alone, right? So it's nothing to get the valuation of these farms much higher than people anticipate. And so I just recently talked to someone about a very similar situation. They had about 640 acres, and it was worth a little over $2 million. and the kids don't want it. They don't want to maintain it. They have a, a neighboring farm that would like to buy it. And yes, here's the great news. You don't necessarily have to take the tax hit. But before we would tell you the solution here, we have to tell you there's a myriad of options, about 12 different options available, the way we do our planning here, where we could either reduce or potentially eliminate the taxes. The outcome, though, is who do you want to benefit? Do you want it for you? Do you need the capital? Do you need the, you know, the proceeds after the sale? Would you be willing to wait two or three years to get the proceeds? Would you be willing to wait 10 years? Would you, do you want the money to go to your kids or grandkids? What do you want to do with that would help give us guidance in showing you what strategies line up? But we have a multitude of them, and usually we're going to pair two or three together to get the best result. Now, this gets into our advanced planning area, and we briefly just talked with Colin Kastrick here about such planning. We partner with someone like Colin to put all the details, dot the I's and cross the T's. But you don't know what you don't know. But yes, I can tell you with confidence, if you were to proactively plan, 
you could remove a big stigma of that tax liability, typically over 90% with proper planning. These are the kinds of issues we sort through when we do the report card, the complimentary comprehensive review of your entire financial situation. 402-369-7777 for a report card. There's no charge and no obligation. 402-369-7777. One more time, 402-369-7777 for a complimentary report card. Up next, is that a Chinese spy hiding in the bushes at the Jean Leahy Mall? We'll explore that next on Retire Smart with David Brooks. Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. Well, David, uh, the UK Daily Mail and the New York Post uh, are reporting, uh, the headline is, after FBI busts Chinese police station in New York City, six more exposed in U.S., and the allegation is that one of them was right here in Omaha. Yet we've not seen the Herald cover There's been this. no local no, follow-up. No local follow-up, this. right? And actually, our producer here, Nick. Producer Nick confirmed. <laughs> this was that, literally almost next door to where his previous apartment was in, in the, <laughs> you know, in just the a Benson year ago. Area, yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, and yeah. and uh, th- this is quite shocking. And so people are like, what do you, what do you mean, a yeah. Chinese police station? Well, the Chinese have what they call the secret police. And and basically, it, it, it's almost like the SS of the old <laughs> days in Germany, right? Uh, they they monitor their own citizens, and we have an influx in the U.S. of Chinese nationals that are going to major universities all over the country, including right here in Nebraska. We have fine schools, and some of the what the New York Post article talked about is these are spies that are getting in to get technology and information innovation from our universities where there's a lot of it. And then they're reporting back to these stations and they're using that and filtering the information. Well, the one here locally allegedly was shut down or whatever quickly after they discovered that maybe they were, uh, they were being investigated by the FBI, et cetera. So anyway, oh, uh, we, we, I would love to hear some follow-up on this, but I just thought yeah. that story was too wild not to, to throw in the mix this Well, week, we're here you know? for you anyway, folks. The other local media seem to be ignoring it. You know, I remember a few years ago, uh, the Confucius Institute at UNL was shut down. There was a series of these institutes at colleges and universities throughout America. That turned out to be a front for nefarious uh, chi activity. And, uh, oh, my goodness. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that one. And uh, uh, Nick will, will check his sources, too, to make sure that cancer doesn't come back. Now, uh, that's foreign creepiness. Here's some homegrown creepiness, possibly, David. The uh, This was a a tweet from uh, a a congressman, a Republican congressman, uh, Thomas Massey, who said your primary care provider was bribed to suggest you should take the COVID vaccine. David, say it ain't so. Well, internal memos were leaked out. This and what's in the story is Anthem Blue Cross, right? This is the Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now, the one we're talking about is the one from Kentucky. Now, they have different programs across the state. But you got to imagine if this was this happening here, it was happening everywhere, right? And, and they were literally getting bonuses to get you to take the COVID-19 vaccination. And it, how you qualify for the bonus, this menu goes right through the incentive payout, the final incentive payout. Basically, if they got 75% of their members within like a, a, a group or a company or their doctor's thing, they would get a $250 bonus per newly vaccinated member if they achieved 75%. It started at $100, so they got 30% of the people to take it, right? And they just kept going up. So there was massive incentives put out there to get people to go take it. Now, why would that happen, Chip? <laughs> well, yeah, well, see, I, I looked in the comments on this story, and I saw someone who said, well, I'm a sales rep. I got a commission for what I do. What's wrong with this? Well, there are a whole other layers of ethical issues here. Absolutely. You're, you're asking someone to take a vaccination that did not stand the test of time. Obviously, we know that now. Um, but it didn't go through the normal processes. And, and we were being, you know, I would say people were being forced. I didn't take one. But, um, you know, a lot of people, and again, no, no. No, no harm, no foul. You, you, everybody has their own choices and what have you. I'm not some anti-vaxxer, what have you. But I do not like when somebody is mandating behavior uh, in, in ways that we believe are unethical, and, and this is unethical behavior. Well, to and, your and question, why? Uh, profit. <laughs> Doctors and insurance companies right? are making money, right? And, and we're now seeing vaccinated. we're seeing the, 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 the pullback on the other side. So there was companies that had the vaccinations, J&J early, Moderna, you know, the stock went through the roof and came back down to earth. And Pfizer, of course, was the biggest benefactor 
worldwide. And of course, there was companies like AstraZeneca that were they didn't have a U.S. vaccine, but in other countries, et cetera. So these type of incentives were put in. And then the government was the one really paying the piper here. So your tax dollars were used, whether you think that's good or bad. So I won't say the word waste of it. In my opinion, it probably was. Uh, but anyway, this is the kind of stuff that gets people a little disenfranchised, if you will, in our political system in general. And by, by the way, I do we do appreciate fan mail. And sometimes we get mail that's not such fan mail. And I got, uh, you know, uh, I will tell you for every 500 positive reactions we get, every once in a while we get one that is uh, less <laughs> than positive, if you will. And so a uh, local listener, and thank you, by the way, for listening. Uh, we, we welcome all. But kind of called me out saying I was, uh, I don't know, Fox News or something. I can't remember the exact verbiage of the email, but but it was it was kind of interesting. And, and, and I, I, like, I remember the, e- the email was in the nature of, boy, you, you know, you get out there with all those conservative positions. Are you sure you want to do that? Because you might turn off me and other people. Your approach has always been, look, I'd rather be transparent and let you know exactly who I am, and then you can decide. If it's a good fit or not. Well, and, and you know, we have lots, uh, I have lots of employees that are, are, are every political persuasion. I've never once asked somebody, uh, could you please, we don't have it on like our family question, could you please mark down your political affiliation? Never right. once to ask right. somebody what party right. they're in, never told our clients how to vote, et cetera. We help anyone and we'll help everyone, uh, you know, that wants our services, that's a good fit for us. But but I think you should always be authentic of who you are. I talk about all the time. Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and I typically vote with my right hand. I joke about that all the time. But I'm I'm not some crazy person. You have uh, a you actually have a piece of legislation that I am pro for by Carol Blood, somebody who probably doesn't think like me right now before our legislature, where it would kind of put the the onus back here locally on some of the decisions your 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 you know some of your spending dollars and school boards, et cetera are uh, going to be made. That's so my state senator in Bellevue. Carol so Blood, so yes. so listen, there, you know, I, I my my brother Lou who's our compliance officer, he ran as a Democrat in in the state of Virginia many many years ago. Uh you know, I'll still love him, right? So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> point being is is what the reason we talk so much in politics is cuz it matters to the money, to the tax code, to the outcomes that our clients are going to have to deal with. And so we can manage our dollars, we believe in a better format if we know Things like taxation, spending rates of municipalities that we live in. Again, I'm not a fan of the streetcar. I've made that obvious, you know, and I think that, you know, 20 years from now, I'll be proven pretty darn right on the spending numbers. So anyway, um, so uh, you know, we welcome everybody. <laughs> I'll go further. I'll go a step further with that, David, and say in, in this day and age for a financial advisor, I would say it is dereliction of duty if you are not paying attention to politics locally, state, nationally, even internationally. Because so much of it can affect your clients' portfolios and your uh, stay the course, don't worry, the markets always bounce back. Well, yes, but for people who are 70 years old, if they get whacked now, they don't they may not have time to build back. So you have got to be ahead of the game, really. Yeah, you and, have to be proactive. be proactive so you can make moves to mitigate the damage of well, bad policy. This is how we Aren't developed active? what we call this proprietary smart planning process. And also, by the way, uh, flattery, you know, copycat, I guess, is flattery. So I, I, apparently we have somebody doing a radio show right here in our local market that is kind of trying to lean on our name, if you will, and, and literally just mimicking. So I guess they're listening to our show one week and regurgitating the next week. Mm. So, you know, uh, I guess that's flattery. But, you know, if you want to get the original source or content, you know, we'd love to talk to you about how our proprietary Smart this planning is the process. The home of the smart process can here. show you yes. how to proactively cover all the key areas to yep. a good, sound financial plan and a successful retirement. S sources of income. M medical and health expenses. A advanced planning for all the factors, such as you and Colin talking about estate planning. R for risk management, and then T tax efficient strategies. Actually, David, this is a perfect segue into our final topic this week, and we only have a minute or so, but I do want to touch on this Fox Business uh, headline. America's retirement preparedness score drops. That's according to a study by Fidelity. Well, that's bad news if you're in our line of work, but I guess it's good news. We're here to help. <laughs> well, it, it's it's true. And consumer confidence is sliding. We just had a big drop in consumer confidence month over month. Uh, we're seeing what we call the rate of change internally. So the rate of change in the economic data is accelerating to the, to unfortunately, the downside. So uh, while yeah, we just had like good earnings out there from companies like Microsoft and Google, the big wigs. Uh, this is a big week for tech earnings, right? Reported earlier this week, and it looks all rosy, right? Well, when you go under the hood, it really wasn't. Now, here, here's the thing: when companies report earnings, Chip, when you're investing, right? Most people are not going to listen to what's called the earnings calls. As professionals, we do sometimes get on the, the the quarterly earnings calls. Well, Microsoft and and Google, between their two calls in this past week, 142 times they mentioned the word AI. 
because they're trying to sell something that's not real yet or it's not fabricated into earnings yet to keep their stocks afloat. So we understand people are scared and they don't feel prepared. And there's and, and 57 percent of the people in that fidelity story were scared to put their money in the market because they felt that if they invested slightly too aggressively, they would lose it all. So to your point, have a plan. That's what the R in the smart plan is for, is to get you back so you feel confident knowing you have a plan, your money's invested, not too aggressively, but it's also not under the mattress as my wife would do, Melissa's mattress money. <laughs> and you got to have your money grow or you're going to lose out. But have a proactive plan is the key. You're right to be concerned. Just don't be frozen in panic. We've got the tax planning guide. That's a great first step. Or just take the plunge and get the report card, the complimentary review of your entire financial situation. And don't forget our estate planning workshop is coming up Wednesday, May 10th or Thursday, May 11th, 6.30 p.m. right here in the Midwest Learning Center at Retire Smart. For any and all of these offerings, 402-369-7777. 402 369 Seven 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 seven. David, bring us home. Have a blessed and prosperous week and get those lawnmowers fired up. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. For David Brooks and the entire team at Retire Smart, have a great week. Attorney Colin Kastrick is not a client and was not compensated for his appearance. Patino King LLC is not affiliated with Retire Smart. However, the Patino King Law Firm is a tenant of and may share clients with Retire Smart.